Hello, and welcome to A Course in Miracles TV. My name is Robin Duncan, and I am your host. Our topic today is the first family of A Course in Miracles. I have a very special guest with me. Her name is Carol Howe. Carol is one of those people that was there, very close to the beginning of A Course in Miracles. She was part of the first family as the course was just getting started. Carol is an internationally recognized master teacher of A Course in Miracles. She is an acclaimed author with over 40 years of experience teaching, speaking, and counseling in the psycho-spiritual field. Carol was a close personal friend of the co-scribe Bill Thetford. In fact, she authored an intimate biography of his life entitled Never Forget to Laugh. She has also created online programs based on course principles, as well as hundreds of audios and videos. Her teachings are grounded in science and research, and she offers practical guidance and welcome reassurance in all areas of daily living. Welcome to the show, Carol. Thank you, dear. <laughs> I remember watching one of your fabulous videos many years ago, and you had such an impact on my life. You may not even know this. <laughs> you, were one of the, you were one of the first people to help me understand the power of my thoughts. I remember that you told a story about taking your dog for a walk, and right as you were getting started, your dog went ahead and did their business right there on some grass, and you said something like you didn't really want to walk around with it in the bag, and so you bagged it all up nice and tidy, tucked it under a little bush so that you could pick it up on the way back, and from what I recall, somebody came speeding up to shout out to you, I saw what you did, and it just made me laugh so hard because I learned how our guilty thoughts can bring on a persecutor somewhere out of nowhere. Do you remember that story? I do. And, and the part that goes before that is earlier in the day, it was a Sunday, and I had done the sermons at the Little Unity Church here in the greater Orlando area. And I had decided that the first sermon was kind of lame. I, I, had, I was really being very hard on myself that I had not done a good job at all. And it's like, why did anybody bother to stay? But the second one was okay. But when I came home, I was really being hard on myself. It's like, heck, that was really awful. And it was not more than 20 minutes later that my gorgeous, big, beautiful German Shepherd dog that I brought with me from Colorado that I loved more than anything in the world, it was time to take her for a walk. So as you say, she did her business. I'm a, such a careful dog walker. I always pick everything up. And as you say, this happened just like three houses from where I live, and I knew I was going to be walking her for 45 minutes. So it's like, I'm just going to stick this under a bush, which is not the first time I've done that. I've done that before when it happened very close by without incident. <laughs> and so just as I'm, so I put it in uh, under a bush in a house that was not even, uh, nobody was even there. It was a vacant house, a bush with a vacant house. And then I walked across the street and I just started and this car races up and the window lowers and this guy says, I saw what you just did putting that, that <laughs> dog poop under the bush and I'm going to call the authorities. <laughs> and I thought, I wonder what authorities you call. And at that point, I recognized him as the man who lived across the street from this house. Now, I'm very new at this point. I'm just like, I don't know, two or three weeks into this neighborhood. I had just bought my house. So this is like, I don't know anybody, except I did recognize that I had seen him. So in any event, uh, he after he announced that he was going to call the authorities for this, um, he left. And I thought, this is fascinating. Yet another example that when you attack yourself, whether the sermon was good or not didn't matter. I was very much attacking myself about that. And I have learned you will never know where the outer 
um, assault is going to come from, but you can count on it's going to come from someplace and you can't avoid it. The only way one avoids this in our outer world is to stop attacking yourself inwardly. Oh gosh! Very Amen to that, right? Amen to that. Because uh, you taught me something that day, and and I did not realize at that point the power of my thoughts. You know, sometimes we think that our thoughts are our thoughts. You know, no one knows, no one cares. You know, and I learned through that story, and it it gave such an impact that I still remember it so clearly. So many years later. I love that. <laughs> you know, I love that you're part of that initial first family of the course. And would you tell us how the course found you, <laughs> how you found the course? I will. I will. Um, we had had a house guest way back in 1977. And as a house present, he sent us a subscription to New Realities magazine, which I didn't know existed. And the very first uh, edition that we got, volume that we got after being gifted with this, included the very first article that was ever written for the public about A Course in Miracles. And it included interviews of several people, the people that would most recognize would be Jerry Jampolsky, and it included the introduction to the text. And I read that introduction to the text, and I thought, this is, this is my answer. Everything I've been looking for. Now, I have to tell you, I've been looking since I was about four years old. Long before I went to school, I thought, something's not right here. Something's missing here. And by the way, sometimes in workshops, I'll ask people to a show of hands, like, how many of you a long time ago when you were little knew something wasn't right here, something was missing, and I'll swear 20% of the people will raise their hands. So I was not unique to this. It's just that nobody knows that a whole lot of other people are having the same experience. So all through my growing up years, I lived in a metaphysically friendly family. So my interests and my searches were supported. And then I had various jobs after college. But all the while in the background, I was looking for answers, thinking I was, this is important to hear because this probably afflicts a lot of people. I thought I was missing information. I thought there's some kind of a missing secret thing. And I read probably over the next 25 years or so, I don't know, 20 years, thousands of books from ancient things to psychic things to medium things to religious things to everything looking for that answer. And of course, I never found, I found lots of fascinating, amazing material, but not what I was looking for. So yeah, I had been at this a long, long time before the course came into my awareness, which was uh, a little over 43 years ago. I'm in my 44th year now. Wow. So when, uh, so all of a sudden you found out about something that really gripped you reading that introduction. What happened after that that brought you into this group of people that became so instrumental? It was amazing. I ordered it immediately in that plain brown wrapper because it was a three-volume work. I remember holding it. It was late in the afternoon. The sun was coming in the window, and the overpowering thought was, my search is over. Whatever I've been looking for all my life is right here. So I devoured it. I had two little boys, and this came close to the beginning of school, a little bit before. So this was the first time that both of them were going to be away, you know, a full school day. They were five and seven. And I spent every moment that I could devouring this book. I couldn't put it down. I would do whatever I had to do as wife and mother and then grab my book. I ended up, of course, reading it many, many, many times. And it took me a while to find enough people who would be willing to do a group. By spring, I had found about 14 people for us to get together to be a group. I was not teaching a class. I didn't know enough to teach a class, but I could certainly facilitate a group. So about that time, that things were now getting off the ground, I could find somebody to talk with about this, I got this flyer in the mail from the humanistic psychology people. I had never gotten a flyer from them before. And it said, 
see how orchestrated this is, that Judy Scutch, the person who was the publisher of A Course in Miracles, was going to be in town, I lived in Denver at the time, doing a lecture, and that Bill Thetford was going to also be there. Well, I would have crawled across Denver on my hands and knees at that point, too. So we went. Uh, it was at a, co a college campus across town. Now, the interesting thing is this flyer did not say a crucial piece of information, which is this was going to be held outside of all things. This is May. It's cold often in the evenings in Denver in May, at least it was then. So I did not go prepared to sit outside. But we did, and Judy was a fabulous presenter. Bill was nowhere to be seen, although this thing said he was going to be there. Finally, after about an hour and a half, I was so frozen because I didn't take proper clothing for this. I thought, as much as I love this, I'm just freezing to death. I'm going to have to just go find a building to go into. So I got up out of my seat, walked towards some buildings, and thought, I'm just going to go inside the first door that will open, open the door. And there, standing in a corner all by himself, is a tall, handsome man who I knew immediately was Bill Thetford. Although I've never seen a picture of him, I knew that's who it was. So for 10 or so delicious minutes, I had a chance to thank him for this amazing course. And he has this beautiful presence and a gorgeous speaking voice. His speaking voice is mesmerizing. And I was simply struck. I had never before in my life met a stranger that I felt such an immediate, inexplicable connection to. Almost so, one of those moments where you oh, knew the person before, you know? Yeah. <laughs> little sad, you know oh, without, oh, without a doubt. Well, after about 10 minutes, apparently either the thing ended or everybody else was freezing as well because the doors opened and a bunch of people came in and that was the end. And I didn't even know what to say. So my husband and I drove home and I was just almost like silent. Mm. I'm rarely silent when I have somebody to talk to, but I didn't know what to say about this sense of connection, and so I didn't say anything or do anything. It was I didn't know what else to do. Well, that was May. About the middle of the summer, some unknown person called me and said, did you know Bill Fetford has moved? I didn't even know exactly where he lived. D did you know he's moved to Tiburon? And I go, Where's Tiburon? Well, I found out it's in the San Francisco Bay area. And I don't know why I needed that piece of information, but I did. And a, another month or so later, a, a wonderful friend who was kind of sort of more or less co-facilitating this little brand new group called, he was a rolfer deep tissue massage therapist guy. And he said, you know what, I'm going to Tiburon for some uh, extra training in my field. And it's like, all of a sudden, I could hear. It's like, I'm not used to hearing voices in my mind. I could hear Bill's voice say, come out. Hmm. It's like, this is getting to be more weird all the time. It's like, so what I did with that was nothing. I mean, what can I do <laughs> about that? But I thought, I will write a letter of introduction for Jason and not knowing where to reach Bill, I just wrote it to him in care of the Foundation for Inner Peace, no other address that I had. And to my amazement, a couple of weeks later, the phone rings, no caller ID in those days, it's Bill Thetford. Uh -huh. says, I got your letter, I'd be happy to see your friend, and are you coming out too? <laughs> it's like, I thought, I'm, I'm living in a parallel universe someplace. I, I had had a very happy, nice, good life. So it's not like I hadn't had a really great life, but this is, this is kind of on the fringes there. And at first I said, no, I was much more conventional then than I am now. And, um, and the next morning I thought, what do I mean no? <laughs> so I wrote and said, yes, I couldn't believe I was doing this. I was now, by this time I knew, and I'm not quite sure how I knew, that Bill was a gay man. 
And so my husband was not alarmed at the fact, and Jason, with whom I was going to be not staying, because he found a friend for me to stay with, but he was not alarmed at the cast of characters involved here. They found the perfect weekend in November of 1978, and I went out, and I met the tiny little handful of people that at that moment made up more or less the first family of the Course in Miracles. Who were they? What I didn't know, when they were passing through town, they were making their very last trip from New York to California to go, are we really going to do this? Are we really going to move out here? And making their final moving arrangements, like their final fine places to live and things like that. The whole thing was just an astounding, astounding kind of unbelievable situation. And so I did go out and the people who were there were Judy and her husband at the time, Bob Scotch. Judy, of course, was the publisher of A Course in Miracles. And Bill and Jerry Jampolsky, who was one of the very first professional people who publicly made the course famous. Much of what goes on today, Jerry gets credit for. Because he was talking about, he started his Attitudinal Healing Center based on these principles. That got lots of publicity. So Jerry was on 60 Minutes and Phil Donahue and traveled all over the world. He launched it out there. Absolutely. So he was the first professional person who put his imprimatur on this material called The Course in Miracles. So Bill, Jerry, Judy, Bob, and another couple who were not married at the time, and ultimately were, Francis Vaughn and Roger Walsh, Mm -hmm. Um, both psychologists, although Roger was not only a psychologist, he was also an EMD psychiatrist and a professor at UC Irvine. And every morning at nine o'clock, the six of them met for an hour at Jerry's house. They all lived very close together there in Tiburon and did a lesson and were there for each other and so on and so forth. Once I made this first trip and I met Jerry on that, I met all of them on that first trip. And so from there on, I ended up, because it's just a quick two hour trip from Denver to San Francisco. So I ended up going out there sometimes for just two or three days at a time to be involved with them, just kind of be part of what was going on. A couple of years later, Jerry and I started doing a lot of projects and so on together. So I was going out there to work with them and, of course, always spent time with Bill. So anyway, it was just one of those amazing things. Where was Helen in in all of this? Helen was was back in New York, although she had a lovely husband and she was very fond of him she was deeply in love with bill Hmm. always was and they recognized in the beginning that they had made some kind of a commitment before they even came on this planet to bring this forward and they boy did they sort out did they get a lot of healing done with each other they drove each other crazy But here was the fascinating part when I interviewed Ken Wapnick, because I interviewed all of the people involved when I wrote Bill's biography, Never Forget to Laugh. He said when they were working on um, their intellectual work, in other words, when they were doing their professorial work and their academic work, they were at each other's throats. And I said, what did they fight about? He said anything, everything. They would just recycle the same old stuff over and over and over again. But when they were doing all the work on the course, because Helen would get the information privately and do it in shorthand, and she would take it in the next morning, and they, as they'd say, lock the door, pull down the shades, and she would read to him, and he would type. He was an amazing typist. He could talk and one thing and type something else at the same time. And sometimes he had to type with one hand because she was so upset and she would stutter and she was, she, because she knew she had to say this, but it was so frightening to her. It elicited great fear and anxiety in her. So we had to like hold her hand with one hand and try to type with the other. And then they would very carefully, word by word by word, after he had typed it up, make certain 
that what she had said and what he typed were the same. They were both extremely careful. And before this, Helen had kind of gotten a, a message that this was hers to do, and she said, I'm not up for this. You know, I'm, I can't do this. I, I'm not ready for this. And kind of the, this was like the preliminary voice of the course that said, kind of like, doesn't matter whether you're ready or not. The world is in great turmoil or in great desperate need of this material. And it's kind of like all hands on deck. Oh, wow. be, not that whether you're ready or not, your skills and your dedication are needed now. End of story. And they answered the call, didn't they? And with that, she obviously gave some sort of an inner permission. So she started to hear these. Now, what's important for people to know in the beginning is in the first several chapters, and we can't spend a lot of time on this because we could spend a whole hour on it, it was kind of like there were three people in the room. There was Bill, Helen, and the voice. So it was kind of like the three of them were having a conversation. And so that's why there was a great deal of personal material in there and things about uh, psychology and psychiatry and things like that that were excluded because it was not germane to the actual message of the course. Mm -hmm. So when they, just, when they did their original editing, that came out, and it came out because it was supposed to come out. I remember as Bill and I got to be better friends and I would visit him and stay with him in California, he would come to Denver and stay with my family. He was kind of like Uncle Bill. Can you imagine my lucky little kids? I could hear down the hallway that gorgeous voice of Bill Thetford's reading bedtime stories to my little boys. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> that was amazing. Now, so, you mentioned that you didn't really get to meet Helen. You heard so much about her, and so you didn't really get to have that one-on-one -on -one contact, but you had a very close relationship with Bill. So very, while all this is going on, and he's feeling called to be a part of this, and you wrote his biography, so you would be the one to ask, mm -hmm. and now that he's passed over, uh, what, um, what would you say was going on for him behind the scenes? Was he feeling blessed or stressed or shocked like what was the emotion for him he was not as shocked as helen because he was not as distraught so to speak as she was it really he was fascinated by it and they wow. had both of them had amazing experiences and right before it happened she would write to him and say I think something's about to happen, but I don't know what it is. And she started having dreams that turned out to be prophetic kinds of dreams. And about that time, Edgar Cayce's work was beginning to be known, the ARE in Virginia Beach, where all of his material is. And he read one of the very first books about Edgar Cayce, which was the closest thing he could find to what Helen was looked like starting to do. So they became friends with Hugh Lynn Casey, who was Edgar Casey's son, and they found him a very comforting support and colleague because Hugh Lynn Casey was able to say, yeah, you know, this is so like the wonderful work. It was different in one way because, of course, Edgar Casey went into a trance and didn't know what he was doing, but getting brilliant material from a seemingly other source exactly. uh, they had in common. And yes. then I think it probably had to bring them reassurance that it's okay, that it's okay to hear information that clearly from a higher place, right? Absolutely. Now, Bill had been completely not interested in this at all in the beginning. He so what was, happened? When did he start bringing it into his life, and what came of it? It became, once enough of it came along, he goes, this, this can't be the first time this kind of material has appeared on the planet. So being an absolutely brilliant man, he starts to do research because this is a teaching of non-duality. This is like Advaita Vedanta, realizing that, wow, this is like a modern restatement of ancient wisdom. It is. He it's recognized nice. that as well. And he, when he started, he and Helen also recognized um, that they had made a commitment to do this before they came. 
So with Helen being the scribe of the course, do you think she ever really understood the writings? Because I, I've heard that she actually passed away from a pretty challenging illness. Was it pancreatic cancer? She spent seven years writing this information down, and then was it something she could apply in her life? It's an enigma because she ended up in a counseling position. Once they began this work, he had to kind of figure out some job for her that was going to get her closer, like physically in the building where he was, because after all, Columbia, where they were, university is a vast place. So they became closer together. Did she ever get to a place of practicing the course oh, of her life? She knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that it was for hers to do. But she was so frightened in general. She used to say, do what I write, not what I do. Uh, and she would say things to Bill when they were scribing like, you're responsible for what this says. <laughs> I'm responsible for the grammar. And if they get the grammar wrong, I'm not doing this again. It's like if That's that doesn't funny. Get crazy, I'm the writer. Like, you're the doer. I'm irrational. <laughs> Bill, I'm the one getting the voice, but you're responsible for what it says. And if the grammar's wrong, I'm calling a halt to this. Wow. So, so you know, you just know your own role. And, you know, mm -hmm. so now Bill, he began to practice these principles. And, you know, they did this for seven years. At what point do you think in the seven years did he really start to put these things into practice at work, at home? Oh, early. Early he recognized this is amazing. And Helen knew it intellectually very well, but she was too frightened to move away from that ego identity okay. and actually practice it. Bill, on the other hand, recognized, and he took those, he, when they were taking the dictation down in the first place, he thought, I need to have somebody to talk about this with. And so he had a pal there at uh, Columbia. And so he would make a copy for himself and Helen when he typed up the notes and one for this man. And so the two of them would have a chance to talk about it. But more than that, as it came through, he would start to put these ideas into practice with his colleagues and with his employees. He had several very high-powered jobs, especially given that he was a young man when he started all of this. So Bill's life is getting better and better, and by the time he leaves Columbia, all kinds of discord in the various departments that he was involved with had been resolved and without knowing what she was saying, his secretary once noticed something that Bill had done, and she said, well, there's that Bill performing miracles again. Now, <laughs> no one, no one at the university except Cal Hatcher knew what they were doing. Mm. This was not public information. They both presumed it would have destroyed their careers uh -huh. if anybody knew. So all of this for years and years and years went undercover. So the short answer is Bill practiced, his life ended in joy. Helen did not practice, although she knew exactly what it said, and she had a, a difficult end of her yeah. life. It's almost like they agreed to do that so that they could present. Here's what happens when you really practice. Here's what happens when you just study and study and study, but you will not let go of your own yeah. guilt. It's just the perfect pair to perfect really bring pair. this to everyone. And God bless Helen that she devoted so much of her life to writing it down and you know that takes so much as we all know how busy we all are imagine you know she's getting this voice talking to her every night and for those that are new or tuning in and you're brand new to all this you know here helen is hearing a voice she's a professor at a very well-known university and so you don't want to go tell your colleagues you're hearing voices and so she's writing it down and she's working out every night for seven years and then she's reading it over to her friend bill and bill's typing it up and you know that's why the two of them didn't share it it wasn't that it shouldn't have been shared it's just that it's just so much for people to take on that you're hearing a voice and you're, you know, those weren't the days that that was uh, anything well, wrong. You see, to, to make things complicated, Bill was Helen's boss. Okay. He worked for him. 
So you can see this just adds interesting layer upon layer to the whole mix there. And what, but what I find moving after all of the years from the time they got started and then it was a seven year process, somewhere along the way they said, what is this? Because see, now we can look back and say, oh, I know what A Course in Miracles is. It's this text and these lessons and this whatever. When they're getting this on a day-by-day -day basis, they go, are we just going to get this from now on? This is when the, the text is coming. They have no clue at this point that there's a workbook and a teacher's manual. And they said, is this ever going to come to an end? And they were told you will know it's come to an end when you hear the word, amen. I always cry when I say this. Is that That's sweet. Think, what must it have been like on that October day when the final paragraph was quoted and it said, and now we say, amen. amen. Oh, that's so beautiful. What that must have been like. It's like I, I'm blown away every time I think about being in that room with them, what that must have been like, and especially before they were given such reliable guidance. In other words, not only the scribing that they were doing, but when they kind of asked for help, they got it. If they ask a question, they got it, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, Carol, what would you say is the way that the Course has blessed your life in the most profound way? You know, what kinds of healings did you experience, just in a summary? Oh. Oh, well, at the level of all of the marvelous people that I got to know, and then, of course, that group expanded, the Prathers down in Arizona, uh, Jack and Leo Luckett, other people in the Tiburon area who, were, who made up his um, only family. It was like the California family with a couple of us from out of town that got kind of included in the mix as well. But it was the California group as compared to all the people he had known in New York that were involved with the last 10 years of his life. And I was deeply into my search when the course came along, but some amazing experiences, some were scary. So one of the things that I always tell all course students, any new students is, Sometimes you'll start to do this course and you'll think, I'm looking for sweetness and light and happiness and peace, and instead everything has fallen apart. It may in the beginning seem like something goes wrong, you don't like the way you feel. That's to be expected because remember, this course is about getting you in touch with your own guilt. This is about getting you in touch with how you are in your own way. You can never heal anything that you've got shoved down under the rug. Mm -hmm. and this just brings unfinished business out from under the rug so that it can be dealt with and healed. And then here it comes, that rug comes up and it, it can make you feel very unsettled at first. This is a plus, not a minus. I don't have time to tell you all the details, except about three months into this, all of a sudden, I had just a terrifying experience. And mm -hmm. I'd never even been, I'd been maybe a little nervous before a piano recital or something, but anxiety or high nervousness or anything was nowhere in my life experience. Well, now you have to tell us what happened. <laughs> and I woke up one night. It was a perfectly lovely night. It was a couple of weeks before Christmas. My kids are fine. Everything's great in my life. And I wake up in the grip of terror, the likes of which I didn't know such a thing existed. I'd never, as I say, I'd never been anything more than a little nervous before, much less anything else. I couldn't make anything fit. I, it's impossible to describe what it was like. And then the error was that I fought against it, but I didn't know not to fight against things at that point. That's why I'm so into telling people don't fight what comes up. But I fought it with all of my might, and it got worse and worse and worse. Didn't go to sleep. The next day was the kid's last day of school, the Christmas pageant. I called a friend with no kids who could come with them. It's like, I don't know what's happening to me. I'm beyond terrified. And she drove me over there. I told my husband that night, and this poor man 
did not know whether to laugh or cry or what to do. After the kids went to bed, I said, I don't know what's happened to me, but so far as I know, I'm dying, and this is how I hope you'll raise the kids. Well, it's like, can you imagine having that told you out of the blue? But every time I got up, I thought, if I walk across this room, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. Now, a few days later, and I realized, of course, after the fact, but quite a while later, I come to lesson way off in the back that says, it can be but myself I crucify. It's myself. How, how did you get to the other side of that? I would have gotten to the other side faster if I had known to relax into it rather than fighting it. But I'd never had any experience like this. I'd never read anything about it. I didn't know anything about it. I, I called a dear friend who was a psychiatrist, and we were supposed to go to my parents for Christmas, and he said, it sounds like you're hypoglycemic, and when you get back, I'll give you a test. And I thought, I am not hypoglycemic. Something catastrophic has happened. And what it was, was that terror. Remember at the end of the text, it says that tiny mad idea, which we remembered not to laugh, where we thought we were guilty and had destroyed ourselves. It's like, oh, it's not kidding when it says, we carry a belief way down there in the unconscious mind that we have successfully separated ourselves right. from our reality or that we have ruined ourselves, that we right. are a destroyer of the greatest magnitude. You were doing so well in your study of the Course, I can only imagine that your ego, which is the part of our mind that we created, just was on high alert. And what I've noticed is that when you get really strong on the conscious level, that our ego loves to come into those nighttime dreams because we're a little less aware at that place. And sometimes it can bring in that feeling of terror. But just like you said, you didn't know to relax into it. And certainly we can always ask for help and we can turn that over to God. We can bring in that light of God. You know, sometimes it could be so startling that you just stop doing what you're doing. And that's the purpose, is to get you to stop. Exactly. You and, and I, of course, I had no earthly idea at that time. It was about three months into my work with it. I'd read the text a couple of times. I was however far in the lessons. I was, I would have never dreamed at that time that I would end up devoting my life to this work. I mean, how could I know three months into this that this is what this would be? And I realized I needed to have, and I've had any number of experiences at one, from one end of the spectrum to the other, you know, from great bliss to great terror, just like if I'm going to be an authentic conveyor of this information, I can't just go blah, blah, blah intellectually. I have to have experienced what it's talking about. Mm. I have to have experienced on an, another occasion great grief. It's, it's that we, car we carry not only fear, we carry great grief. All of this stuff is kind of like if there's a bottom to our unconsciousness, that's where it is. Right. And so that when it talks about what we're afraid of and what we're running from and what the result of being um, ego-driven what what that's all about it's like it, as far as i'm concerned i needed to have those experiences yeah. and, and i needed to today? have them before i knew anything about them right where are you today in that journey now that you've kind of had those ups and downs and what's happening today for you oh, in your life marvelous i love my life <laughs> i love what i do which is devoted to it and i've had some spectacular at the other end of the spectrum experiences. Oh, so good. I'm very, very clear that the Course knows what it's talking about. Remember, in the very beginning, it says, this is all about removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. It doesn't say you've got to manufacture love's presence. It says, this is about, and it's primarily about getting in touch with the guilt, that belief that we've ruined ourselves, and do not underestimate the fear that's associated with, I've ruined myself. We can slightly say the words, but the stuff that we carry about that, and we can't, we process it 
a little at a time, a little at a time. And if you want to know the specifics of what we need to let go of, your relationships will show it to you. Exactly. So, Carol, where can we direct people to find all of your audios and videos? Tell them. If you come to my website, carolhow.com, because we not only is Bill's, bi it's not only Bill's biography, it's um, the, the most comprehensive backstory of how the course came to be. Oh, that's great. Oh, never like, forget to laugh, right? Never forget to laugh. And the reason it's entitled that is I had the sense of Bill being around. I couldn't really believe I was experiencing this, but I was. In other words, it's like Bill was around. And close to the end, I'm kind of playfully saying, Bill, what is the title of this book? You know, because it had a working title, but I knew that. Was. He said, my inner information was, you'll know when you get to the end of the book. And it's like, well, I am at the end of the book. He said, I, w I was on the last chapter, probably what turned out to be, I don't know, three or four pages from the end. And he said, but you're not yet at the end. <laughs> it's like, well, technically, no, I'm not at the end. So as I was writing, you know, you never know what you're going to write. It was like, blah, 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 blah. And never again will we forget to laugh. And it uh -huh. was like, and you knew. <laughs> I knew that was the title, and it was so fitting because Bill Thetford was among many of his other talents. He was one of the funniest human beings I've ever met. He had an amazing sense of humor. Aww. I have to tell you this one last thing. We're probably all going, but in terms of like in many occasions, I had sort of an inner sense Bill was around. And finally, as we're getting kind of close, I was actually in this room, and I am said out loud, Bill, how do I actually know you're really here? Because I had had some experiences that it would seem to end, because I'm not the clairvoyant type where I see people in the room or like other people do, but I'm very intuitive. So he said, ask Judy about the plaid dress. Now, that is a very specific thing. And so I was a little afraid to ask her because this is so outlandish. It's Judy Scutch, of course, Whitson. Ask her about a plaid dress. So it took me a couple of days to have enough courage to do this. So I talked to her and I said, um, I didn't even tell her why. I said, is there something about a plaid dress that's important to you? And she said, indeed there is. She had a younger sister who was about nine years younger than she was. And she said there was a picture and she sent me the picture that she's got on a plaid dress and the little sister is a year old. And this is their first official, you know, the photographer comes in and takes a picture of these two girls together. And it was always very precious to her because her sister died mysteriously in a plane crash many years ago, and they never found the plane or what happened or anything else. So I thought, I give up. When I get that kind of feedback, like, as this is involve a third party, ask Judy about the plaid dress, and it turns out to be an important question to have asked, I've given up having any doubt whatsoever that Bill Thetford helped write the book. What a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing just that personal up-close look that maybe so many of us have not had. Maybe we can have it through your eyes, right? Maybe you could finish us with just a, a short, beautiful miracle story to send us on our way. This is another one that happened before the course came, about a year before, and before I would have known its definition, which is why it's valuable, because it happened before I knew how it worked. This was in the era of 
Alexandra Lowen and so on, where you know you needed to get your emotions out, which everybody's sort of enjoined not to do, you know, hold everything in. And you pound on the bed with a tennis racket, you scream and yell and carry on. Well, being a nice, polite Southern girl, screaming and yelling and pounding and carrying on was forbidden. So my girlfriend and I would get together, put the kids someplace else, we'd lock the door, pull down the shades, and we'd and it would say, like, imagine somebody that's face on the bed and just smash away and scream and yell. I had to go down on my own and practice screaming in the sauna down the basement because I was such a lousy screamer, having to be such a nice girl. All of that was very, very, very helpful. So I decided I would smash my father. Now, my father was a very nice man. He was a very lovely man. But way back when I was a little kid, it was like children are seen and not heard. And parents didn't know anything about uh, regulating children's emotions. They just were supposed to not have any, you know, that kind of thing. So there was a lot of kind of repressed stuff going on. So I thought I have to choose somebody, and I didn't really have any enemies. So I'm smashing away and carrying on, and we do this two or three times. Well, a few months later, we go down there for Christmas. And my, my thought about my father was that he had taken such good care of us physically, you know, we had a lovely place to live and all of our outer needs were taken care of, but I never had the feeling that I was particularly cared for, you know, at that emotional level. So we go down for Christmas and almost instantly I'm floored. I have a different father. He seemed to be so glad to see me and he smiled more and he hugged me more and we had the most marvelous visit and when i left he gave me some more money and he said i just want you to have this in addition to your um, christmas present and i was floored because this was before the course comes along that says when you release your own guilt when you change your own mind when you take responsibility for what's going on with you the people around you mysteriously get to be different. Wow. So you felt like you had done that to a degree, and then your father showed it right to you. Absolutely. And since I didn't know that this is how it worked, the only thing I knew about forgiveness is what you learn in Sunday school. Well, the other person is the problem, and you're supposed to pardon them and be okay (laughs) with the fact that you're victimized by their villainy, none of which ever possibly could be possible to do. But, you know, who knew? I didn't at that time. This is like, I don't know, 45 years ago. And it was wonderful that it occurred because that was the last Christmas we ever spent together. He had a stroke the next fall and that was the end. So we had our last meeting together as a really marvelous one. But remember what it says, like when we change our minds, Remember, the world is a reflection of what's going on with us. So we're now seeing things through a different lens, through a different matrix. My, I have a different pattern going on in my own brain now. Right. And it's reliable. It works, folks, 100% of the time. You change your mind. I can't tell you how many people over these 40-something years will either call or write and you go, You'll never guess what's happened. My brother, my mother, my kids, my whatever. It's like they've gotten to be so nice. It's like, yeah, that's the way it works. So it's not only relationships with people. It's like suddenly financial situations. Remember, guilt is a request for punishment, and you're going to get it. It's like being down on your knees praying, please ruin my life. And since your outer world is a reflection of your inner world, you will appear to be punished, but you will not recognize yourself as the punishing agent until you put all these pieces together. And then your world will be miraculously different. Exactly. And also guilt is an election, so we can elect out and go back to love, right? That's the whole (laughs) point. That's the whole point. The problem is we haven't connected the dots to realize that our guilt is responsible for every problem we've got. Right. For for every distressing feeling that we're feeling. Uh, Carol, I can't wait to have you come back and we can dive into relationships and you can share those beautiful 
pearls of wisdom that you've learned from the course and from your own direct connection. So thank you so much for the details of those early days of A Course in Miracles. I am so grateful. And thank you personally for all you've done to be a champion for the course and the way that you've blessed me in my life. You really helped to kickstart that journey. And I know that you have helped people all over the world with their relationships. And I can't wait to bring you back and have you share some of those pearls with others. So I love to do it. Thank you so much for doing what you're doing to allow more and more and more people to be acquainted with this absolutely life-changing material. It uh, is my pleasure. Thank you, Carol. Have a great day, and thank you for joining me. Thank you, hon. You got it. This is Robin Duncan with A Course in Miracles TV. Be sure to check out our website at acourseinmiracles.tv for upcoming events and resources. This channel is offered for public benefit, and your support is so greatly appreciated. Thank you for joining us today. Remember to expect miracles. Have a very blessed day. Bye-bye now.